Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah alhamdulillahi hamdan yuwafi ni'amahu wa yukafi'u mazidah wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Allahumma alimna ma anfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidina ilman ya kareem By the grace of uh, God the most gracious we come together today to speak of a, an important subject and that being the subject of you know, transmission or the transmission of reports in, uh, you know, the Islamic faith or Islamic religion. Now, you know, unlike other faiths or other religions, there's something unique about Islam in that Islam has been, you know, transmitted to us from the Prophet Muhammad, God's peace and blessings be upon him, to us in our time in a lot of things. In fact, in almost everything that we do, things have been transmitted to us with a chain of narration. Now what does that mean? What I mean to say when I say that is, um, that you have the Prophet The Prophet, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. Now he says something or he does something. He says, uh, you know, a believer uh, should love his brother. Mathar. Give you just a simple example. Al Muslimu akhul Muslim. A believer is a brother to another believer. So you should treat each other in a brotherly manner. How do you think we understood and we recognized and we realized that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam actually said this? It's a question. So anybody can raise their hand and answer. How did we learn to find out or how do we find out that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam actually said this statement from the hadith? What's a hadith? Hadith is a you know they'll translate it in English as a tradition, a statement, a statement of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did it just come to us from the sky? Did it just land on us while we were sitting in the you know, living room watching some TV? No, the way that it was transmitted to us is a type of transmission that is you know, one seldomly found if you know, ever found in any other religion. And that is that one person would say, I heard the Prophet Muhammad wasallam saying such and such. And he would narrate it on to ten people. So a sahabi, a companion of the Prophet, he would say, I heard this, the Prophet wasallam said, you know, Prophet Muhammad, uh, he said such and such. Now 10 people took this statement from this companion who directly heard it from uh, Prophet uh, Muhammad, and all of them then narrated on to other narrators. And so on and so forth. Until it actually reaches us. And a lot of people do not realize, and if you don't, then do, that even till this day, this whole you know, concept of transmission of the tradition, the prophetic traditions is available till this day. So for example, you have a mu'adhin who gives the adhan. Okay? In, until, up until very recent times, and even today in certain mosques in the world, you cannot go give the adhan just like that. You have to be a person that has had direct you know, um, link to the Prophet ﷺ in the Adhan. So, to, or to Bilal ﷺ, you know, the Mu'adhin, the person who used to call uh, the Adhan or the call, the call to prayer, he would say, recite the call to prayer, you know, you'd have to have a direct chain of transmission all the way down to this individual for you to go and give the Adhan. Just to what? Just to make sure that the deen is perfectly preserved. And as I said, until this time, even the Adhan, Allahu Akbar, Allah, we hear it all the time. You think it just came down to us like that? No, it came down to us in, numer- in, in, in numerous narrations to an extent that it's considered mutawatir, it's considered a recurring narration. Recur- something that cannot be falsified because it's been narrated by so many different people. When the Sahaba were there, one person near, you know, giving the Adhan, there'll be 10,000 people that might have heard this Adhan. Or less, or more, a thousand, fifteen hundred, whatever it may be. 
Can you imagine 1500 people narrating the adhan of the Prophet ﷺ onwards to another generation and so on and so forth. And all those generations would also see the action of the mu'adhin or the person who calls to the prayer. You know, and they would take and even learn the action. So the action would be recurring because it was taught from the first generation. And even just the fact that it actually occurred would be recurring as well. To an extent. And I was coming here, as I was coming here, I was thinking, what exactly should I talk about? I really didn't know what to talk about. So I asked the brothers, um, you know, tell me what to talk about. So we're having dinner, lunch. And as we're having lunch, somehow we started talking about, I had a big cup. If you guys want to see a picture, I have some pictures. At uh, Chili's, I had a big cup of juice. A very large cup. You know, very large glass of juice. It was one of the largest glass of juice I've ever had. And I was like, you know, subhanAllah, this cup of juice or this glass of juice is almost the same size as what they would call the mud of Rasulullah you, Does anybody know what mud is? Does anybody know what a mud is? No? A mud is a measurement. It's a, it's a type of measurement. Okay? A mud is a type of measurement. What's a mud? It's a type of measurement. Now, there is a lot of different Islamic rulings in zakat, in um, uh, tahara that are actually related to mud. Okay? So it's basically, if you have a little, that container right there, you know, you can't see it on the camera, but the guy sitting here can see. That container right here, if you want to bring it, you can bring it. This container right here would be a little bit smaller than what would be considered, what would be, what would, you know, what we'd consider a mud. Okay? Just so you have an idea. It's a little container basically. Now, you'd imagine a container that was there 1400 years ago. You'd imagine that the measurement of this container would be lost. And we would kind of just have to guess what exactly the measurement of this container is. Isn't that so? That's what we'd imagine, right? So, to our surprise, that is not the case. This mud, this measurement, which the Prophet ﷺ used to use to measure the water that he would make wudu with. That to measure the water that he would make wudu with. This measurement is transmitted down to us Till this day, 1400 years later, every single person taking it from the person above him and actually buying a container, purchasing a container, making a container and making sure that the measurement is exactly the way it should be. Till this day. Till this day and you know, from amongst Allah's honor upon me is that I have that measurement at home. With a direct chain of narration right down to the Prophet ﷺ. So above me, an individual, yet another, yet another, yet another, all the way down to a Sahabi that measured it with the container of the Prophet ﷺ to make sure that we realize how much water the Prophet ﷺ would use to what? To make wudu. What kind of beauty is in, the pres- in this type of preservation of the deen? Can you imagine any other religion on the face of the earth measuring the amount of you know, uh, water that their prophet takes to wash themselves? Can you imagine? And not just measuring it, preserving that measurement in so, with such great scrutiny. When I got this measurement, you know, I have this measurement with two different narrations. When I got this measurement, my container was taken by the shaykh, you know, who gave me the container or the measurement, and he took that container and literally poured water in it and back and forth just to make sure that the measurement is entirely accurate. So it wouldn't be just given just like that. You'd know now that this is the amount of water that the Prophet ﷺ would use for wudu. But by the way, this would, you know, mud. The measurement of mud is not just used for wudu, it's you know, the ahkam pertinent to, or the rulings pertinent to, mud are found in zakat, and they're found in other chapters, 
of al-fiqh al-islami as well. But then, it doesn't stop there. The Prophet ﷺ had another container. He had another container that was called Asla' Asla' al-Nabawi. It was called what? Asla' al-Nabawi. Now Asla' al-Nabawi, Asla' in the Arabic language, it's another measurement. This measurement is equivalent to four muds. And we saw a picture, we saw a little example of how much a mud is approximately. Right? Asla' al-Nabawi. The Salah al-Nabawi is not preserved with the way I said it right now. That it's equivalent to four muds. The Salah that was used by the Prophet ﷺ, this measurement was used by the Prophet ﷺ to take, shower, take a shower. So the Prophet ﷺ would never take a shower from, you know, with more water than a Salah. Salah is equivalent to about four muds. And same thing. You have people that took that container that was used by the Prophet ﷺ, Sahaba, and they would measure and make sure their container is entirely equivalent. And now you would have this tradition being passed down for generations and centuries and 1400 years where 30 people, 15 people, 25 people would have made sure that their measurements, over generations by the way, we make sure that their measurement is exactly in accordance to how much the Prophet wasallam used to take a shower with. Can you imagine? Can you imagine a man taking a shower and people making sure that they even know how much water was used in the shower of this man? This is only in the deen of Muhammad wasallam, deen of Allah wasallam, that was brought and given to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi And this is how, and this, all of this and more, and I'll continue speaking, more just shows us the truthfulness of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said when He said, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ Verily we have revealed unto thee the reminder, and we will be the ones who will protect that reminder for you. You have this adhan that we give every single day, entirely preserved in a manner that you cannot find in any other faith. Call to prayer. Not just that. The sunnah itself at large, this is just few key examples that you know may uh, cause some surprise. For that reason I brought some of these examples that you know a person wouldn't even think that even the amount of water an individual uses to take a shower would be preserved. We know exactly how much that water would be. But the sunnah in entirety was preserved in the same manner. Now, to surprise you some more, it's not just anyone that can go and pick up, you know, the sunnah and say, oh, the Prophet ﷺ said, so I'm telling you this hadith. To make it, you know, put it in more simpler terms, for anyone that would be in this chain of transmission, for anyone that would be in this chain of transmission, for the ulama, for the scholars of Islam and scholars of uh, Islamic tradition or what they would call traditionists, they would have a number or a variety of conditions for the transmission of this individual to be accepted. So let's look at what those conditions are. You know, when the transmission is accepted, this would be known as an authentic narration or a sahih hadith. Or it would be known as a hasan narration. As in, you know, authentic as well, but not rigorously authentic. What are, what are those conditions? There are five conditions. أَوَّلُهَا الصَّحِيحُ وَهُوَ مَتَّصَلْ إِسْنَادُهُ وَلَمْ يَشِذَّ أَوْ يُعَلْ يَرْوِيهِ عَدْرٌ ضَابِطٌ عَنْ مِثْلِهِ مُعْتَمَدٌ فِي ضَبْطِهِ وَنَقْلِهِ أَوَّلُهَا الصَّحِيحُ The first of those conditions, or the first of those, uh, the first type of a hadith is an authentic hadith. And what exactly is this authentic hadith? It's a hadith that would be entirely connected. Okay? So I can't come today and say, Oh, you know, Bukhari said such and such. So I'm going to narrate the hadith directly like this. I heard from the Bukhari, who said, he heard from his shaykh, who said from here from his shaykh, and so on and so forth. It wouldn't work like that. The, the chain would have to be entirely connected. There would be a person that would directly hear it from the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. 
Then the person that heard it from the Prophet Muhammad, there would be another that comes, he's also di- directly heard it from this individual. Then there would be a third person. He would come and he would directly hear it from the second person. Then there would be another person that would come, he would directly hear it. You wouldn't find it just in a book and say, oh, this is the statement of the Prophet Muhammad. Not like that. It had to be directly heard. Until this day, you have people that have you know, statements of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam that are directly heard. Between me and this hadith that I'm telling you today, الرَّاحِمُونَ يَرْحَمُهُمُ الرَّحْمَانِ The people who are merciful to one another, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be merciful unto them. This is a statement of the Prophet wasallam. Between me and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's 23 narrators of this chain, this particular hadith right here. So 23 people away, the hadith, and now all of you, 24 people. 24 people away, this hadith was heard directly from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Can you imagine? You, all of you today, 24 people away from you, this hadith was heard directly from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ar-Rahimuna yarhamu hum ar-Rahman, irhamu man fil ard, yarhamukum man fil sama. Be merciful to those that are around you in the earth, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be merciful unto you. This is what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. Now as I said, all of you have heard this tradition straight from me, who heard it from another person, who heard it from another person, all the way down to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So between you and the Prophet ﷺ, have yourself, feel this, that you have 24 people away, you've heard a statement straight from the Prophet ﷺ. And it wasn't just found in a book, it was actually heard. Somebody just like me came and told me that the Prophet ﷺ said this. Another person came and told him the Prophet ﷺ said this, and so on and so forth. And now you'll go home today and say, I heard Fulan saying, that the Prophet ﷺ said such and such, and you'll be part of a chain now. It's not, deen is not, you know, it's preserved in a manner that is, you know, unprecedented in the history of humanity, not the religions, just not just the religions, in the history of humanity. So the first thing is that it will be connected. Connected chain. Every person would have heard it, Directly from the one right above him. أَوَلُهَا الصَّحِيحُ وَهُوَ مَتَّصَلْ إِسْنَادُهُ وَلَمْ يَشِذَّ أَوْ يُعَلْ And there shouldn't be something called shuduth. Now people forget sometimes. Isn't that so? I told you the statement. Can everybody repeat it directly back to me just the way I said it? The answer is not everybody. Some people may forget. صحيح? But most people, when they're writing it down and they know they're hearing it directly, you know, from the Prophet ﷺ, or they're hearing something that was directly heard from the Prophet ﷺ, you know, they would be careful and they would memorize the statement. So let's say 15 people heard it. The second condition I'm mentioning. Let's say 15 people heard it. One person deleted a word by accident. It's possible, people forget, right? One person deleted a word by accident. And it sort of changed the meaning. Because of the deletion of one word. I mean, if I say, don't drink water, and I tell you, drink water, is there a difference? One, one word was dropped and the meaning entirely changed. But you have 15 people saying that you, should, you shouldn't drink water, and you have one person that says, drink water. So you know, definitely, maybe this guy was sleeping when the teacher was saying, don't drink. He only heard drink. He was sleeping for, you know, a word or... Maybe something happened, he couldn't hear for a second, whatever it may be, or he forgot. So he thought, you know, the person was saying, drink, whereas he's really saying, don't drink, right? They said that this type of behavior in a chain is unacceptable. So if you have a chain of 15 people, 5 people, 6 people, they're all authentic narrators, and you have another person that made a slight mistake, this hadith would be considered weak, the one that the mistake is in. Where it would be considered shad or daif, you know, a type of daif. Where the hadith goes into direct contradiction with the narration 
of the ones that are stronger. And you know, sometimes we have one hadith that's narrated by 70 different chains, by 200 different chains. So definitely we'll know that 200 out of them, 180 are correct, and maybe, or 190 are correct, and maybe two or three might have made a mistake because they forgot, you know. But we have it protected to an extent that we know there's 197 of them that are correct. So it's not far-fetched that 197 people, you know, they made the same mistake. You understand what I'm saying? So this has to be out, this cannot be in a chain. You cannot have a mistake of one person that goes against a large number or one person that goes against a very strong narrator. Okay? So this hadith that has that contradiction would be considered weak. This tradition that has that contradiction would be considered weak. And the others would be now considered mahfuz or protected. Protected from that chain. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that the transmission of this deen will be protected. And as I mentioned this verse just previously, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ Verily we have revealed unto thee the, the, the reminder as in the book of Allah Azza wa Jal and the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we will be the ones that will protect it for you. أَوَلُ وَالصَّحِيحُ وَهُوَ مَتَّصَلْ إِسْنَادُهُ وَلَمْ يَشِذَّ أَوْ يُعَلْ يَرْوِيهِ عَدْلٌ ضَابِطٌ عَنْ مِثْلِهِ مُعْتَمَدٌ فِي ضَبْطِهِ وَنَقْلِهِ Now let's come. Let's see who's permitted to, to narrate. Who's permitted to narrate? Yes, the Sahaba, all of them are permitted to narrate. But for, for example, today I told you um, a narration. I told all of you a narration. If a muhaddith was to come and you say that Fulan said, you know, Abdul Wahab said that he heard from somebody who heard from somebody who heard from somebody who heard from somebody, heard from somebody all the way down to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, the Prophet ﷺ said something like this. Is every single person in the world, are the, I had 15,000 people in front of me, I told them all. Is every single person in the next generation, is every single person going to be accepted? The narration of every single person is going to be accepted? The answer is no. Even for the person narrating, just to make sure it's protected even more so, there's certain conditions. So not just anyone can get up and say, oh today, you know, I heard a hadith, I'm gonna go narrate it onwards. And even if you do, they'll say, oh maybe this, this hadith could be weak because there is something wrong with the narrator. Inshallah, all of you are good people. <laughs> and all of you will narrate the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And you will uh, do it properly. But... You know, there might be some people, like for example, they say, the person has to be adil. He has to be an upright individual. What do, I, what do I mean when I say he has to be an upright individual? The ulama, they said that that means that he has to be a Muslim. First of all, he has to be a Muslim. Alhamdulillah, all of us are Muslims. Baligh. Alhamdulillah, all of us are baligh as well. We've all passed the age of puberty. Aqil. Sane. Because you know, children can make mistakes. Maybe they don't understand. Maybe they miscomprehended what the statement was, so they don't want to take a person that's a child. So then, the person has to be a aqil. He has to be a person that's entirely sane. So a person that is insane, his hadith, wouldn't, his tradition wouldn't be accepted. In the chains of narration, if a person comes is insane, he's saying that the Prophet ﷺ said, said such and such and such, would his, chain be, would his narration be accepted? No. Because he's sane, he's insane. Maybe he's you know, gone crazy, he's thinking that he heard, and he never heard, he was probably sleeping, you know. So, sanity, salimun min al-fisq, the person has to be protected from fisq, he has to be protected from, you know, apparent disobedience to God. So you have a person that, you know, smokes, he drinks, he parties at night, you have all this kind of bad qualities in him. And then he says, Oh, the Prophet ﷺ said, and you know, the Shaykh was talking about it today in the Dawah Center. And you know, I heard, well, inshallah, everybody over here is good, but you know, maybe standing outside, <laughs> not coming to the class. Um, you know, that, uh, that the Prophet ﷺ said such and such and such. Now, if he was to be, let's say he used to be a narrator of traditions, would we accept the tradition of this man? It would be considered a weak tradition. Because this person is not an upright individual. He's going against the, 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 
commandments of his Lord. If he's going against the commandments of his Lord, how are we sure that he's not going to go against another commandment, and that is that you shouldn't be lying? What if he lies? Even though we don't know he lies or not, but what if he lies? Just what if? You know? And those what ifs from the traditions of the Prophet ﷺ and the transmission of the deen of Allah are cancelled. You don't put a what if. So we have to have a person that is extremely ethical, that is extremely, you know, well behaved, upright. And lastly, the person also has to have a good public persona. So the person might be pious between him and his Lord. He might be pious between him and his Lord, but everybody knows him to be an evil person. Is this person, his tradition going to be accepted? He might be pious between him and his Lord. He, he did a lot of sins in his life. He, you know, um, became, uh, but, but you know, his community is not ready to accept him. Certain communities are like that. He accepted the teachings of Islam, and then he started following the teachings of Islam. But you know, in this particular community, people are not accepting him. Because they've seen another past of his. But alhamdulillah, in most communities in the world, people are ready to accept such a thing. But you know, between him and Allah, he's made tawbah, repented. Allah has forgiven everything. But we still will make sure that this individual, this individual, that doesn't have a very good public representation. That goes against societal norms. For example, he goes and picks his nose in public. You know, he's standing there, he's digging at his nose. Does, is this something ethical to do? Huh? Or somebody starts putting his hands in his pants to scratch himself. No, I mean, this is serious. You know, so, somebody starts scratching himself. Is it haram? You know, the answer it's not haram. But is it ethical? Huh? It's not ethical. You know, so this person that's you know doing something like this that even goes against public norm and goes against ethics, his traditions would be sidelined and they wouldn't be acceptable. And now you have only the pure narration from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Can you imagine this detail in terms of how the deen is preserved? The Qur'an is narrated to us like that. And that's, rather the Qur'an is narrated even in a better manner. And if I speaking, start speaking about that, that would be an even greater and longer lecture. And a lot of shock may come to some of us. Because we don't know how the Qur'an was preserved. The sunnah is preserved in our deen just like this. Every single detail, the, the, the type of shoes that the Prophet ﷺ used to wear, the type of hat that he would wear. The place that his cloth was made in. Can you imagine? Can you imagine a man that walks the earth? Let's look at any leader in the world. Today, he's really popular, he's coming in the media, thousands of people know him, you know? Can you imagine that you'd even, you, you, you go and know, you know what the tag behind his shirt says, made in China, made in Singapore, made in whatever? Well, we even know where the clothes, some of the clothes, of the Prophet ﷺ were made in. Whenever the narrators say he was wearing such and such, they would also mention Sahuliya. You know, they would also mention different countries where this cloth of the Prophet ﷺ came from. So every single thing is preserved in a manner none like other. And the more you look at the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu and you find the type of things that are preserved, the more you become shock at shock, and the more you become, you know, fond of this prophet, fond of this deen, and the more you realize that this couldn't be except through divine intervention, except that Allah subhanahu wa taala wanted for this deen to be preserved so that people can have it all the way till the day of judgment, and people can be awestruck, just like you are today. From hearing these type of preservation methodologies that were, you know, used by our generations to make sure that the deen is passed down to you. And you inshallah will make sure that that deen is passed down to the generations to come. Inshallah ta'ala. This is all that I have to say. If uh, I said something good, it's from Allah Azza wa Jal. 
And if I said something evil and I made any mistake, it's for me or the shaitan. وَصَلِ اللَّهُمَّ عَلَى سَيِّدِنَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَالصَّحْبِ وَالْآلِ أَجْمَعِينَ